Hi everyone, my name is Brooke and welcome to Slow City Church at Home. We are so glad that you are here. Before we jump into worship, I want to share this psalm with you. I keep my eyes always on the Lord. With Him at my right hand, I will not be shaken. Therefore my heart is glad and my tongue rejoices. You make known to me the path of life. You will fill me with joy in your presence. We are so glad that you are here with us. said it would be easy You never said there'd be no pain But you promise you'd go with me And your promises you always keep But I confess how much I need you I confess that I am weak I can promise I won't fail you But your promises will not fail me When I'm in the valley I will fear no evil When enemies surround me
everybody, and welcome to Slow City Church at home, online. My name is Brent. I got a few announcements for you. If it is your first time worshiping with us, wherever you are, we want to say welcome. We are glad that you're here. There's an I'm New tab on the website, slowcity.church. We would love for you to click that, explore a little bit, fill out an online connect card, and we'd love to connect with you. We have groups coming up. We have a regathering plan coming up in the next month that we're really excited about. Um, you can also sign up for our email list there. Um, as always, um, we dream of being a generous church. We believe God has called us to be an open-handed and generous church in step with our community. That's why we partner with the city and other organizations locally to bring real tangible hope um, where we are. This is made possible by our collective generosity. So if you feel it on your heart to give, you can give at slowcity.church slash give, or you can download the Slow City mobile app on all platforms, Google Play, Amazon, um, Apple, iTunes, all those things, and you can give um, there. Those gifts make it possible um, to live generously in this city. Also, on July 6th, it's a Monday night, we're having popsicles on the patio. It's a week from Monday. Um, live music, popsicles, friends, physically distance. It's going to be an incredible time. Today, we continue in our Rethink series on week three. We've been in chapter one, chapter two. Now we're going to be in chapter three. The sermon is about to drop. So check out this really fun bumper. And, uh, and then we're going to continue in our series. We're glad you're here. Hey everybody and welcome to Slow City Church at home, online, wherever you are, however you are, we are glad that you are here with us today, worshiping with us um, online. My name is Brent and I'm one of the pastors here. I'm so humbled and excited um, for this collection of people that desires to live the way of Jesus, bringing hope to everybody. Um, you've heard us say it, but you need to know this is a place where everyone is welcome. Um, we believe nobody's perfect, but anything is possible. Um, and there is hope, literal hope in Jesus for everyone. And we want to bring that hope to everybody. Um, we are in the middle of summer. We are a hundred plus days into sheltering at home, into a pandemic that has flipped our world and our schedules and our rhythms and our relationship upside down. This has been an exposing season, a revealing season. And in just a month or maybe a month and a half, school is going to start back. We don't know if it's going to be in person or digital or online or streaming or what it's going to look like. We don't know what the future holds, um, but we know we are called to be faithful um, today today. Um, and um, I, this past week, we had the opportunity to gather together in person for the first time in 100 plus days um, outside on the football field at Mission Prep High School. And it was awesome to just be in the flesh with one another singing. We turned it up. We got noise complaints. Um, and it was awesome. We are making plans to gradually meet in person again. Um, and we want you, want you to just keep checking back on the website. Um, um, slowcity.church um, to follow, follow along with, with new events and things um, coming up. Today, we are in week three of our Rethink series um, where we've been walking through um, the, the book of Philippians, a letter written by Paul. Have you ever run into something that you needed to rethink? Remember, to rethink means to think again or to, to reassess. To think again or to reassess. Have you ever run into something in your life that you needed to reassess, to look at again? Now, I love problem solving. And so when pandemic happened, um, well, there was an obstacle. But we, we were, I, like, I love this. We, we see the opportunity. We see the obstacle, but then we see an opportunity to respond. Problems are possibilities. And I love the creative process of taking something scattered and pulled apart and broken and dreaming and planning and building, pulling things back together. I love looking for solutions. But without fail, every time in the looking for solutions process, in the creative process, I always get stuck. Have you gotten there? I always hit a wall. 
I always run into a difficulty where I need to back up from the situation. I need to reassess and ask myself, what am I missing? What am I not seeing here? What do I need to do differently? Think about differently. I need a rethink. In the, when, when the quarantine first started and sheltering at home was like, was on high alert, um, my family and I went back through some, through one or two old seasons of Survivor. Do you remember this show? Do you still watch Survivor? Jeff Probst and they drop, they drop 20 people off on a deserted island with no food and no shelter. They've got to win all these challenges for rice and twine and something to make a fire. But my family got really deep into the Survivor world. And Every, every season in Survivor, there, was always these, uh, there were always, always these puzzle challenges. It wasn't like a, a thousand word puzzle on a, on, a, on a table, but it was like these wood puzzles where you had to move pieces around. And without fail, contestants on Survivor would always rush into this process. They would run as fast as they can, grab all these pieces of wood blocks and try and piece together this puzzle. And without fail, they always got to a place where they were stuck. They had to back up and they had to reassess, sometimes taking all of the pieces out of the puzzle so that they could rethink, look again, and reassess, what am I missing? In Paul's letter to the church in Philippi, which he helped start, he's writing to them, I want you to back up. Maybe pull some pieces back out and rethink, reassess, Look at what you're missing, and I don't want you to miss this. I want to give you a rethink. I want to give you a different perspective. When you get stuck in life, um, when you get stuck thinking about death, when you you hit a wall and and your faith is is challenged, um, I want to give you a new lens. I want to give you a rethink to look at faith and humility and purpose and peace and joy differently. Back up, take a breath. And look, look at Jesus. Look at Jesus and see differently. Paul's writing, Paul's writing, no matter the letdowns, no matter the stuckness, no matter the failures, no matter the unmet expectations, no matter what you're into, where you've been, your past, your failures, your feelings, we look to Jesus and we gain a, an ability to rethink um, and find joy. Paul continues. We've been through chapter 1 and chapter 2. Now we're at chapter 3. You can follow along if you want to open your Bible. We'll be um, in Philippians 3, 1 through 15. In in Philippians 3, um, verse 1, Paul says, My brothers and sisters, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to write the, the, the same things to you again. It is a safeguard for you. He says, rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to tell you this again. It is a safe guard for you. Recently, um, recently in the middle of the night in my home, I'm a, I, I, I crash about 1030 when my head hits the pillow, I'm out. But recently, something has been amok at about 1215, like, like clockwork, every single night. Um, there are these birds. I don't know if they're migratory birds. I usually love birds. I like bird feeders. I like all those things. Uh, I, I'm getting older. I like birds. Um, but, I'm, but, but there are these birds that start singing, squawking. Like they are sadistic, like, like terrible birds that in the middle of the darkness, in the middle of the night, they sing and sing and sing and tweet and whistle and go on and on and on right outside my window. And I am asking myself the question, I'm I'm talking to the birds, do you not know what time it is? Do you not, are you not aware of your circumstances? Do you not see that it is the middle of the night? It isn't morning, the sun isn't up, it is dark. Like you're supposed to be asleep. You're not supposed to be singing. It's annoying. Honestly, when I read Paul's words, my brothers and sisters rejoice in the Lord, I had that same kind of thought. Bro, are you serious? Don't you see the circumstances that these people are walking through? Don't you see the hardship? Don't you see the difficulty? Don't you see the persecution? Paul, don't you even see your circumstances? You're in a dark, cold prison cell chained to a guard and you're telling us to rejoice, to whistle, to sing. Are you kidding me? It's no trouble for you. It's trouble for me. 
It's trouble for me. We look on the news and we see pandemic and we see job loss and we see relationships on the rocks. We see racism and unjust violence and viciousness. And Paul, I don't know if you knew this, but it's an election year, bro. And like there are, there's pandering and there's politics and there's division and there's all of these. Have you turned on your Facebook feed, Paul? It's a nightmare. It is the middle of the night. Rejoice how and why. And I think our response to that, how can we rejoice, is rooted in this, in, this, um, in this reality that we easily get joy and happiness confused. We read the word rejoice and we think, be happy, sing, whistle, but joy and happiness are different. And I think this is important. Happiness is defined like this. Happiness is a feeling of pleasure determined by circumstance. A feeling of pleasure determined by circumstance. I, I become very happy when my wife comes home from Costco with a big bag of Brookstone uh, chocolate-covered blueberry and acai things. You know what I'm talking about? Like, I, I become very happy because I, I, my circumstances have changed. Now, a few days later, when I go to reach for the Brookstones and it is empty because my kids have pillaged all of it, I become unhappy because my circumstances have changed. And I think it's interesting both culturally and individually we often live to change our circumstances so that we can experience the feeling of pleasure, so that we can experience happiness. Think about it. It's even written into our constitution. Life, liberty, and the pursuit of, fill in the blank, happiness. So we often live to be happy. We often live to change our circumstances. If I can just change this or get this or get this house with this yard, have this much saved, then I'll be happy. Or if I can accomplish this, earn this, get that vacation on, have a nice steak and some, and some potatoes. I like steak and potatoes. Then I'll be happy. If we could just get this person into office, if my team wins, if my kids finally behave, if my relationship gets worked out, if my circumstances change, then I'll be happy. Then I'll be confident. Then I'll have reason to celebrate. Happiness is a feeling based on circumstance. And we often live for the pursuit of happiness. And yet, we lack joy. You know the difference, right? Happiness is a feeling determined by circumstance, but joy is more than happiness. It's different. It's, it's, it's better. Biblically, we see something unique about joy, and it's, it isn't rooted in circumstance, but it's rooted in confidence and a hope and found in God's presence. Biblical authors you wrote often about joy. Psalm 16 says this, You make known to me the path of life. In your presence there is fullness of joy. James in chapter 1 says, Count it all joy, my brothers, when you meet trials of various kinds. Jesus himself said, When you see me, you will rejoice and no one will ever take joy away from you. Joy can reside regardless of circumstance because joy defined is a settled state of confidence regardless of circumstance. A settled state of confidence regardless of circumstance. Joy remains in the middle of the night when the sun is down, when everything is dark, when everything else is asleep. Joy sings in the middle of the night and whistles. Joy is not happiness. It isn't this circumstantial feeling, but it is this deep rooted, settled state of confidence, of assurance, of hope. And Paul writes, take hold of joy. Take hold of joy. Because he's discovered a confidence that is unshakable, immovable, and it's real. And he writes, it's a safeguard for you. Joy is a safe. It's no trouble for me to tell you this, but joy is a safeguard for you. It is actually protecting you from 
harm. When you find and hold on to and take hold of joy, you find safety. You find security. How can Paul write that? He's in prison. Because he has something deep down inside of him that holds him together, that holds him up. Two Christmases ago, we went um, up to Sacramento. We bought the boys some Kings tickets um, to see the Kings play the Pelicans. There were 11 Kentucky basketball players on the court at one time. It was an amazing time. Our girls, Jenna, Hattie, and Isla, came up to Sacramento, and they shopped for a bit, and then they, they went ice skating. My little girl, Isla, was uh, four and a half or five at the time and had never, never ice skated in her life. And if you've ever stepped onto the ice with those skates on and tried to, tried to do it, it's, it's, it's pretty dangerous. It's pretty dangerous. And so, so my wife, um, in her great compassion, she is a wonderful mother, did whatever mother would do. She held her hands um, and she guided her around the rink. It was busy, it was packed, people were flying past them, and, and she took hold of Isla. Isla took hold of her mother's hands. Now, on the last lap, Isla had developed this, this, um, this self-reliance of, I can do this on my own. And she let go, she forcefully let go of, of my wife's hands, and for the next um, the next few minutes were a blur. She fell. She busted her chin open. Um, there was blood everywhere. We were screaming. There were towels. There were, there were, it was, it was insane. We rushed to the hospital and she got 10 plus stitches in her chin. It was, it was intense. And I was thinking about that this past week because, because the joy in the moment, joy protects us from the pain and disappointment of a fake confidence. Of a, of a false hope. And Paul writes, take hold of joy. Take hold of joy. Take hold of the confidence that you find in the Lord's hands, in knowing who you are. It's a safe guard. It's protection for you. That doesn't mean circumstances won't ever be bad, but it means you can be held up and held together and deeply rooted. After this, in, in, in verse 2, um, he says, I want you to watch out, and I want you to be careful. Here's what he says. Um, he says, watch out for the dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh. It gets real here. For it is we who are the circumcision, who we, we who serve God by His Spirit, who boast in Christ Jesus, and who put no confidence in the flesh. Though I myself have reasons for self-confidence, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh. Now, a lot of church things and church words being said um, in these couple sentences from Paul, I want you to hear and understand the historical context. Um, there's, like, there's a circumcision reference in here, but here's what, back, backing up, here's what Paul's saying. Watch out for those who put confidence in themselves. See, Paul's encouraging us, take hold of joy, not in what you do. Watch out for those who, who take confidence in what they do, what they've done, what they've gained, what they know, and what they've even done to their bodies in the religious rituals and rules that they believe they've mastered and they've mandated for everybody else to take part in. These people take confidence in what they've earned. Watch out. Don't become one of those. Watch out for those who put confidence in themselves. Because these people, as Eugene Peterson says, all they're interested in is in appearances. All they're focused on is, is their appearance. Isn't this our tendency? Isn't this our our go-to. We put our confidence, we put our hope, we put our trust in self-reliance and self-made. These, these things aren't always bad. What you've gained isn't always bad. But isn't it our go-to that we're so wrapped up in appearances? Paul says, watch out for those dogs, those evildoers, those mutilators of the flesh who are so consumed with their appearances and, and the products they produce and what they gain and what they have. Man, maybe we listen to Paul's encouragements here. He says, take hold of joy. It's a safeguard for you. This is not safe to put your confidence in what you've done and what you have and what you've earned. 
And in a moment of gut level honesty today, with just you, yourself, and you, and I, can I ask you, what do you put your confidence in? What do you put your trust in? What makes you feel steady and safe and strong? Is it, is it, is it sure? Do you put your confidence in you? You pull your hands down from God and say, I got this. My confidence is in me and myself. Do you put your confidence in status, in sex, in stuff, in looks, in what others think of you, in your reputation, your awards, what you make, what you drive, who you know and who knows you? You put your trust in where you've been? Do you, do we put our confidence in the flesh, in what we gain, and how good we think we are in our credentials and our achievements. And can I ask you, are you happy? Do you have joy? A settled state of confidence? Paul wants this for his friends. The hard truth is that insecurity and lack of confidence runs rampant, amok in us as we try and find it in outward appearance and in personal achievement. You know this, but you can appear confident and strong and put together and even happy and inside be terrified and unsure and miserable. Rebecca Crane has this powerful quote. She says this, the outside doesn't always match the inside. The outside doesn't always match the inside. We get this. Because on the outside, we can have this appearance of put together, but on the inside, we can be falling apart, lacking a settled, sure, safeguarded joy. Avi Nevo is a venture capitalist with billions and billions of dollars in properties. And he, has, he says this, I have everything and I have nothing. Sometimes I feel like the loneliest man on the planet. When we put our confidence in what we have and what we've gained and what we've achieved and what we can do, we can easily have and attain everything and yet have nothing. And Paul says, watch out for this fake confidence. I've been there and I've done that. He goes on in verse four through six and he talks about his pedigree. He talks about what he's done and what he's become and what he's attained and how he's achieved. He says, if someone else thinks they have reasons to put confidence in the flesh, I've got more. Look at me. I'm circumcised on the eighth day of the people of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of Hebrews. And in regard to the law, I'm a Pharisee. People want to be me. As for zeal, I persecuted the church. I protected the law. I was law and order. And as for righteousness based on the law, listen, he says, I am faultless. You can't, ha you can't like, you can't, what is it? You can't hold a, a candle to me, a stick to me, a lighter to me. What is, I don't know what it is. What's that saying? He says, you can't, you don't compare to me. Look at what I've done. And yet Paul's gotten to the end of it. When he had everything, he runs into Jesus and said, even though I have everything, I have nothing. Stick with me here because in verse seven through 10, he says this, all those gains are good garbage. He said, whatever were gains to me, verse seven, I now consider loss for the sake of Christ. What is more, I consider everything a loss because of the surpassing worth of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord, for whose sake I have lost all things. Look at this line. He says, I consider them garbage that I may, be, that I may gain Christ and be found in him, that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Have you ever um, gotten to a point in your life where you, where you acquired so much stuff that your garage was overwhelmed with stuff? We have four kids and we have a dog and we've had cats and we've had all these things before and we have just gotten to a point where we just acquire and we've been gifted all these toys and all these things and we've gotten to a place where our garage has just been so consumed 
And I don't know if you've like ever seen the show Hoarders, but where we can just hoard and we go, I, I don't want to let go of this because this ha has a memory attached to it. And I don't want to get rid of that because Keegan sat in that for a couple weeks. And I don't want to get rid of that book because I used to read that and we can just acquire and gain and gain and gain and achieve. And I've got my, my couple trophies from when I was in middle school. And I've got my yearbooks and I've got all these old t-shirts that for whatever reason have sentimental value. We can acquire all of these gains. And Paul says, Paul says, I consider all my gains, all my accomplishments, all my pedigree, I consider it garbage. It's good. It's good. There are things, there are good things that we can get. There are good things that we can accomplish. We can have our good resumes. We have all of these things, but we can pursue them to the point where they clutter our lives. And Paul says, all of these things, all of, these all of this confidence in myself is good garbage. Is good garbage compared to knowing and gaining Christ. Paul gives them this lens. He says, here's a different lens and a reassessment I've made. Take hold of joy. Take hold of joy. It's not what you've done, but it's what's been done for you. It's what's been done for you. And he says, I count all this that I've gained as good garbage compared to gaining a relationship with Jesus. Now this is countercultural to us. This is counterintuitive to us because we are trained to gain and to get, to acquire and to save and to get bigger and better. And Paul says, the joy, the joy, the hope, the confidence is found in gaining a relationship with Jesus. Paul writes, I've been there, I've lived it, I've had it all, I've received all the accolades, I've received all the credit, and, and there's an end to it. He says, nothing else compares to knowing Christ. Nothing else matters, nothing else lines up to it. Self-made righteousness and accomplishments and trying to find confidence, even in religion, it runs out. It's good garbage, but a relationship with Jesus is this settled state of confidence. It is concrete, it is real, it is a safe place, it is a safeguard where real joy is found. And knowing a loving God, and knowing who you are in Him, this is where I'm found. I'm got in Christ. I have gained Christ. This is joy gained in Christ. Debbie DePorter, um, was as positive a lady as you will ever meet in your life. If you needed a smile in any moment, you would just call Miss Debbie. She grew up not knowing her earthly dad, but it did not affect her joy. Did not affect her joy because she knew her heavenly dad, her heavenly father. And that old saying, is your glass half empty or half full? Debbie's glass was 100% full. And it spilled over to everyone she met. She was humble and joyful and faithful and was a genuine follower of Christ. She was honest in everything, a positive encourager, but would tell you the hard truth when you needed to hear it. Debbie loved her husband, Eugene. She called him Han. And she adored her two daughters, Danny and Mallory. In January of 2015, things began, it began to shake. Debbie was diagnosed with breast cancer. And immediately, they told the family that there was no cure or successful treatments for the kind of cancer that she had. For two and a half years, they tried everything. And she battled and she fought and they prayed. She spent good time with her family and with her husband. There were lots of ups and downs and back and forths. And on June 1st, 2017, Debbie DePorter passed away. A month or two after her passing, I had lunch with Eugene and uh, was moved by his deep love for his wife. The, the, the wound was still raw and still is. And the pain he, he honestly expressed with tears falling down his face at our, at our lunch together um, struck me, hit me. 
And yet the deep, unshakable, settled joy and confidence he carried himself in, he exuded. There was this deep resolve in him in the midst of the worst that life had to dish out to Debbie and himself and his kids. In the midst of tragic circumstances, I saw in his eyes and in his tears and in his life a deep, residing, settled state of confidence. Regardless of circumstances, I saw joy. I saw, I saw joy. And I recognize too, it's in moments of loss and where life just sucks, where life is just hard, nobody lists their accomplishments. Nobody talks about the boat they just purchased. Nobody talks about what other people think about them. Nobody falls back on their reputation. Nobody falls back on the, the confidence that they take and all of the things that they can do. Those things are exposed in that moment. What you, what you trust in, what your confidence is, where your joy is found, wh whose hands you're holding on to. And Eugene, I saw it in him, was rooted and together and confident and pressed on in knowing and gaining Christ and knowing Jesus and being known by Jesus. And I keep seeing it in him today. Eugene leads a team that sees new churches started all over the world and he's charging and impressing young leaders from Brooklyn to Bangladesh, from Istanbul all the way to San Luis Obispo to take hold of joy, not in what you've done, but, at what, but in what's been done for you. And he shared with me this week, this is still hard. It's still hard for me to talk about, Debbie. I get so emotional. And I'm still learning to trust God, to put my confidence and my hope and find joy in God. And still I see in Eugene, one who presses on. Paul writes to his friends in Philippi, take hold of joy, not in what you've done, but in what's been done for you and press on, endure, press on, keep going. Don't stop, keep taking the next step. In verse 12, Paul writes, but I press on to take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. He says, brothers and sisters, I do not consider myself yet to have taken hold of this. I'm in the process, but one thing I do, forgetting what is behind and straining toward what is ahead. I press on toward the goal to win the prize for which God has called me heavenward in Christ Jesus. All of us then, listen, who are mature should take such a view, a reassessment, a rethink of these things. Paul writes, rethink and press on. And I love that line, take hold of that for which Christ Jesus took hold of me. What's he saying right there? What did Jesus, for which did Jesus take hold of me? The writer of Hebrews gives us this glimpse in Hebrews 12 verse two. He says, Jesus took hold of us for joy, for the joy set before Jesus, for the settled state of confidence that he ushered in for everyone, he endured, he pressed on to the cross, scorning its shame, and he defeated death and sat down at the right hand of the throne of God. It was for joy. It was for the joy of the Lord. It was for your joy that Jesus endured the cross. So we take hold of joy. We take hold of joy, not in what we've done. Paul says it's good but man, it's garbage compared to the gaining Christ. We take hold of joy in what's been done for us, in what God's done for us, and we press on. Though our circumstances, our circumstances will change, happiness will come and go, feelings will come and go, emotions will come and go, we stay rooted and confident and connected to a God who for joy brings you joy. Do you know that joy? Is your joy found, rooted, settled, confident, and holding the hands of the Lord? Rejoice in the Lord. It's no trouble for me to tell you these things. It's a safeguard for you. Do you know that joy? Maybe you've been running your life and you're doing a decent job, but you're still empty. Or maybe the rug's pulled out from under you and you're really struggling right now. 
Maybe you're at the end of your rope and you, you, know, you have moments of happiness. You like that show. You like those Brookstone chocolates. You like that team. You like that game. But there's this, there's this something deeper that's missing. It's joy. It's a settled state of confidence. Let's pray. God, we love you and we thank you. And I pray for my friends today who are in, um, who are walking through life in the middle of changing circumstances. And I just pray, Father, that for myself and for my friends, that we would grab a hold of joy, that we would see that we can be known and we can see and we can trust you. We can see that we are loved and forgiven and adopted and cherished by the God of the universe who for the joy set before him took our sin and our shame on a cross to stand us up and give us confidence. Not in accomplishments, not in earthly gains, not in a, in a packed garage full of stuff, but in knowing Jesus. May we know you, Jesus, your saving grace and your call to follow after you for joy. It's in Jesus' name, amen. spoke a word you were singing over me you have been so so good to me before I took a breath you breathed your life in me you have been so so kind Couldn't earn it, I don't deserve it. Still, you give yourself away. Oh, the overwhelming, never ending, reckless love of God. Oh, oh, oh. No 
your shadow, you will light up Mountain, you will climb up Coming after me There's no wall you won't kick down Light you won't tear down Coming after me There's no shadow you won't light up Mountain, you won't climb up Coming after me There's no at Slow City Church at home. We are so glad that you were with us. Be sure to stay connected by downloading the app or checking us out on the website. Hope you have a great week.